Om Shanti. The name of the chapter today is The Yogi's Take and Exam. The work of the spiritual university went on. Men, women, and children continued to take the knowledge. Through the power of meditation, yoga, they discovered the strength to transform their personal lives. Unfortunately, their transformation highlighted the lifestyle of those unable to shake off their weaknesses and caused a huge problem within the community. The province where God had chosen to descend was a wealthy one. It contained more than its share of prosperous businessmen. Many of those businessmen traveled far and wide to sign contracts in international markets. They were sometimes away from their home for much of the year. This left their wives free to pursue whatever activities were of interest to them. If a wife showed religious inclination, of course a traveling husband was happy to encourage that, feeling that such an attitude implied the wife would be faithful, would maintain the household carefully, and would spend her free time doing worship in the temples, thus avoiding temptations. It never occurred to the husbands that their wives might do even more that they might actually put true religion into practice, changing their diets, their habits, the company they keep, and most significantly of all, maintaining purity of mind and action. A ship full of these traveling merchants and industrialists disembarked one afternoon. These were men weary of the battles of commercial wheeling and dealing. Some came home victorious, having landed lucrative contracts or sold full inventories of their goods. Others had been less successful, but one thing they all shared, they were yearning, <clears throat> they were yearning for the woman they had left behind. Their minds were filled with the prospect of rest and comfort and sexual pleasures. However, during their absence, their wives had met and fallen in love with God and were now faithful to him. The woman's dedication to purity was firm. They refused to give in to any form of persuasion or harassment. The result was predictable. Disappointment gave way to anger and the husbands became violent. They shouted, they slapped their wives, beat them with straps, prevented them from going out, sealed them off from all contact with Brahma Baba or Om Mandali, vainly trying to erase this influence with the spiritual father, which the spiritual father had had on them. But the wives were not the submissive playthings that they had left behind. They had become strong. How can a powerful soul tolerate a weak soul's attempt to subdue her? Could a man whose only advantage was physical strength succeed in making a Shakti, a woman filled with God's might, surrender to lust? Impossible. So the struggle or force, so the struggle of force and convention against the power of spirit built up to a climax. Each woman had her own battle to win. Some had an easier time of it than others. Some had to endure torture, but they had faith in and relied on God's help. And through it all, they kept on singing. I am Shakti. I am peace. I am always a step beyond. Illusion and attachment I destroy. I play the flute of knowledge. So all can hear and know and live in joy. Such sweet and blissful music makes unhappiness depart. So the world will become a garden. We souls will all be free, free of bodies or of body consciousness. Even in the midst of their husband's worst behavior, these women would remain cool and humble, stabilized in 
remembrance of God. They would sweetly, they would reply sweetly, O oh soul, you are my brother, and I wish only for your benefit. I want to turn this place into God's temple. How can you wish otherwise? If you and I fulfill this wish, then this house will be, will be like heaven. My love for my husband has not diminished. It is only that now I understand who you are. You are a soul and I love the soul, not the body. You must also. It would be disrespect to you if I were to do otherwise. You are the eternal son of the Supreme Father and I am his daughter. So let us walk together and keep our minds focused only on one. I shall continue to perform all my worldly duties with even greater effort than before and carry out my household tasks with efficiency and devotion. Work that I never did before, I will willingly do. But do not prevent me from going to Om Mandali. We children of God are cleansing our souls, burning away the negative tendencies from our minds forever. Do not place an obstacle in our way, for we are under orders from God. Do not put before us of sex. Our father is pure and bodiless, and so we are becoming the same. Please recognize the time. The Iron Age is about to end. A golden age is being created anew, and you also may take your birthright to be a part of it. Cooperate with us. Be a yogi. Let us make our lives pure and beautiful as a lotus flower. Please, I beg only this of you, a pure life. Birth after birth, we have been involved in the pleasures of the senses, but now for this one, last, last remaining life, for the short years which remain before destruction, let us remain pure. The woman's words were lovely and well considered and strong but it was like pouring water into sand. Their husband's ears were closed. The outrage they felt were based on the tradition that women should have no other in their thoughts except her husband and that her role in life should be to please him in every way. This was a very strong tradition in the social structure of the society and they understandably felt that the behavior and attitude of their wives were undermining their own authority. But when they saw that they would never again have their way with this woman, some of them became enraged. They attacked and beat their wives until they bled. It happened that several women were assaulted on the same evening and the next day they escaped to Om Mandali. It was unnecessary for them to tell what had happened because it was evident from their appearance. Their faces and bodies were bruised and blackened. There was blood on their torn clothes and some cuts were still open with blood oozing out. Their husbands had taken away their jewelry, dresses and any money that, they, that was their personal wealth. The women had been driven from their homes. The younger girls at Om Mandali who saw the way these wives had been mistreated, decided and decided then and there never to marry, but to spend their lives in purity. They now understood the wisdom of Baba's great counsel. O oh, children, lust is your greatest enemy. Lust, anger and attachment are the doors to hell. Now, after seeing how women were beaten like animals, they lost all desire for marriage, even had Brahma Baba given permission. Next chapter, starting, the name is Anti Om Mandali Party. Meanwhile, the husbands banded together. They felt that the whole fabric of the society 
was being undermined by their wives' challenge for independence. Such behavior was contrary to the tradition of marriage as well as their sexual rights. They were also joined by the grandfathers, fathers, and brothers of numerous un unmarried girls who had adopted celibacy. Those relatives were determined that the girls should marry. The men formed a group called the Oman anti Omandali Committee, determined to force Brahma Baba to stop recommending purity at his satsang. Representatives of the committee went to see Brahma Baba. They presented three husbands who demanded the right to have intercourse with their wives. They had badly beaten their wives after being denied. One of them had even filed a lawsuit demanding his rights. The matter had stirred up such a furor in Sindh that many community leaders had become involved, siding with the husbands. Some of these leaders were also present at the meeting. They said, Brahma Baba, you must tell these women that they should have intercourse with their husbands. Brahma Baba replied, I am only giving away spiritual knowledge. How can I tell anyone to indulge in lust? If they do not wish to come to this satsang, then it is their own choice. But lust is contained in the Gita, the, su the supreme scripture as the door to hell. Should I give false advice? My own daughter observes celibacy. Who gave her the order to do that? Who gave me the order for that matter? We are all obedient to the same one God. To the same one God, the Supreme Father. Brahma Baba went on to explain his position. These are not my commands. I am only a servant, an instrument of God's service. How can I order anyone to do anything? No one is under my control. The one who gives orders to them gives orders to me. The people left, but their opposition had not ended. In fact, they stepped up their campaign against Om Mandali. Ignorant people were stirred up. If women start observing celibacy, they worried, how will the world go on? The anti Om Mandali party was powerful. Its members were rich and had strong ties with the government and community leaders, which they now used for their own ends. They hired intimidators to go door to door, telling families they would be ousted from their caste if they allowed their daughters or wives or mothers to go to Om Mandali Satsang. They frightened people, and when that didn't work, they abused them and even beat up a number of people who raised objections to such tactics. The mayor and civic leaders were pressured to keep a mandali out of the city. The anti-party had friends on the boards of the local newspapers, including the major one, the Sindh Observer. Soon, vehement editorials were being published against Brahma Baba and his satsang. Those men who had supported Brahma Baba in the past became frightened and quietly withdrew their support. Those businessmen who had been coming to the satsang themselves on a regular basis and had written letters of permission for their daughters and daughters-in-law also to take part, men who had publicly praised Brahma Baba's work, now feared loss of business and social ostracism and so they stayed away. Not only that, but many even joined the opposition, becoming officers of the anti Mandali party. Even the Mukhi, a well-known local dignitary and relative of Baba, and an open admirer of him for a long time, stopped coming to the satsang. He began to half believe the spreading rumors and became fearful of the violent threats being made against any who dared speak up for Brahma Baba. Soon he also joined the anti Mandali committee and its members, realizing the coup they had achieved 
and made him its president. Only a few days before Brahma Baba had seen the Mukhi and given him a gramophone record as a present. The record contained a beautiful song, one verse of which went like this. Oh God, take me away from this world of sin to some far, far, far off place where there is peace. I cannot live in this corrupt world for even a moment more. Take me away from these cunning, lustful, selfish, worldly people of deceptive speech and hateful wisdom and, hate and hateful vision. Take me to where the deity stands, the golden age. The record was meant to be an aid to the Mukhi to help him keep the memory of God fresh in his mind. The song was beautifully sung, but when people came to know about the record, they whispered malici maliciously to the Mukhi. There is black magic in this record. Never, never play it, or there will be a terrible effect on all of you. Do not touch it either. We will call a magician to examine it and find out what kind of magic is in it. The Mukhi also believed this to be true, so he said, all right, call the magician. They were able to get hold of one who had a reputation of being able to get rid of ghosts by pressing the hand of the one possessed, as well as many other secret arts. He came and performed an exhaustive examination. Finally, he gave his diagnosis. Oh yes, there is a great influence of black magic in this record. You are all fortunate that nobody has touched it yet. Otherwise, there is no telling what could have happened to you. Upon hearing this, people began throwing stones and bricks at the record so that the magic inside would be destroyed. They kept on till the disc was smashed into a thousand pieces and the magician told them that the evil had fled. Such was the superstition of some people of India. Truly their intellects had turned to stone and yet there were others whose minds were being filled with God's direct teachings and whose behavior was being transformed. This was the real magic, the transformation of character, magically produced by Shiv Baba, the one who turned vultures into swans and souls full of bitterness into loving souls. So the misguided people who attacked the record album were correct in thinking it contained magic, but it was the beautiful magic of knowledge which could not be destroyed. One of the observers of the assault on the record said, Oh God, what an unfortunate land India has become. Not only has the ancient wisdom been forgotten, but even common sense is lost. Ignorance and blind faith in the scriptures, many of which had been expanded or changed so much that the original message has been lost. Now let them astray to the extent that an institution like Om Mandali could be mistaken for an evil force. But then it is a fact of life that if an individual opens a shop to sell real diamonds, beside a shop which sells fake ones, many people will believe his diamonds are also false. Even if he gives every assurance possible of the truth and value of his gems, people will have no confidence. It is a rare individual who will be able to depend on his own intellect and use impartial judgment and thus buy a diamond from such an individual. And so it also happens when the Supreme Father arrives to give away diamonds of knowledge. How many can discern the one true merchant from the many false ones? So with that, we'll stop here. So one more page left in this chapter and tomorrow we'll uh, continue with another chapter called The Battle of Good and Evil. Om Shanti. Om Shanti, thank you. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Om Shanti.